Today, I will provide an overview of suggestions on how to teach economics and focus on Unit 1 fundamentals, especially standards SSEF 1, 2, and 3. In economics, topics are conceptual, and it's very useful to introduce a concept, return to it later to teach it, and provide examples in the future to review. This rule of three was first introduced to me by Gary Petmecki in a Georgia Council for Economic Education Advanced Placement Workshop. I have since incorporated this into all levels of economic classes. I have found that students are less likely to give up when content is introduced with very easy to understand examples. Later, I reteach it. Then, review. This builds student understanding. Whether you call it contextual teaching and learning or real-world examples, economics was made for this approach, or vice versa, perhaps. Regardless, use real-world examples throughout the class. If you are weak in knowledge of production, go on a tour of a factory, attend workshops from the Georgia Council for Economic Education, the Federal Reserve, or your local RESA to build more content and pedagogical knowledge. Realize that middle school teachers have laid the foundation for the high school economics class. Most of the fundamentals unit, as well as some international and macroeconomic standards, were taught in middle school, not just once, but repeated in each country studied. Personal finance standards begin in elementary and build throughout the grades. It is extremely worthwhile to collaborate with the 6th and 7th grade teachers in your system to find out what examples they use when teaching their economic standards. If you reference their example, students will better recall the subject knowledge. I will discuss extensions to the economics class in the last module, including incorporating inquiry and policymaking analysis. Simulations are great tools in economics. Be sure to debrief them effectively to get the maximum understanding for your students. Be sure students know you are simplifying the process to teach a concept. The real world is not simplistic. In economics, we hold other factors constant, that is, ceteris paribus. Let me give you an example. Neither individuals nor government officials ever have complete information when making decisions. But economic analysis can provide a mechanism for improving policy decisions. See the last module for an inquiry-based lesson with policymaking. When you discuss who gets what, when, and how, politics, be sure students understand that we are a pluralistic society and compromise is necessary to resolve differences. Our goal is creating individuals who think like economists and participate in civic life. When teaching economics, I advise either starting with fundamentals or personal finance in order to hook students. Then micro, macro, and international economics. Use international examples as you teach in order to familiarize students with the last unit before you formally teach it. This layering helps build their foundation. Remember that economics is the study of how individuals, businesses, and governments make decisions, such as what did you buy for lunch, etc. Here's how I begin the course. Let students practice being economists from day one. Here are two great first day lessons. I usually have students pick up handouts as they enter the room on day one and have them begin working on the day one warm-up quiz as I check attendance by going around the room. As I circulate checking paperwork and finding out preferred names, I give hints to each group of students to get them thinking like economists. Ask them to weigh the cost and benefits of each bill on question one. The next day, I will have students copy basic vocabulary while I play music and allow a volunteer to eat multiple chocolate bars in order to teach diminishing marginal utility. I explained this lesson in the last portion of this module. Either lesson is great for day one. This is the first portion of the warm-up quiz. After students have had time to deliberate both individually and in small groups, I begin discussing question one. I ask students to raise their hand if they will pick up the $100 bill. 
then anyone who will not pick it up. I say, let's analyze this and draw a chart. To begin, I show students the inside of my wallet with no cash there. Then I ask them what is my additional or marginal benefit of picking up the $100 bill. They should say $100. Then I ask them what is my new total from picking up the $100, also $100, since I had zero before. What is the additional or marginal cost of picking up the $100? It takes one minute at $10 a minute, so $10. My total cost is also $10. I ask students what is my total profit. It is total benefit minus total cost, which is $90. My additional profit is also $90 since I had zero before. Or you can calculate marginal profit by subtracting marginal benefit from marginal cost. So marginal benefit greater than marginal cost, pick it up. Ask students to raise their hand if they'll pick up the $50 bill, then anyone who won't pick it up. Ask students what was the marginal benefit of picking up the 50, $50. Now what's the total benefit? $150. Now what is the marginal cost? Another $10. So the total cost is now $20. The marginal profit is marginal benefit minus marginal cost, so $40, which makes the total profit $130. So marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost. Pick it up. Will you pick up the $20 bill? Well, the marginal benefit is $20, making the total benefit $170. The marginal cost is another $10, making the total cost $30. The marginal profit is $10, making the total profit $140. Because the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, total profit increases, so pick up the bill. Will you pick up the $10 bill? Yes or no, either way is fine, but picking up the $10 means the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost. Both are $10, so the marginal profit is zero. When marginal profit is zero, we have not added anything to total profit. Therefore, we know total profit is at its maximum. Will you pick up the five? Never, because the marginal cost of $10 is greater than the marginal benefit of $5. Total profit is reduced to $135 because the marginal profit was negative $5. When marginal benefit is less than marginal cost, no way. Marginal analysis is the foundation of economics. Take your time with this. As long as you can afford something, don't look at the totals. Instead, weigh the marginal benefit versus the marginal cost. Doing so will result in improved solutions to problems. Tell students to watch for the hints in economics questions. The key words. If you want to maximize the amount of money in your pocket, you pick up all of it. To maximize your at-work salary, you pick up none of it. To maximize total profit, you pick up $170 or $180. Here are questions 5 through 8. Questions 5 and 6 introduce students to the profit motive. And questions 7 and 8 to the principle of voluntary trade creates wealth because both parties would not enter into an agreement if they did not gain. Here are questions 9 through 11. Question 9 continues introducing marginal analysis to students with a hiring decision. Question 10 introduces students to the concept of real, which means adjusted for inflation. Question 11 continues marginal analysis practice. Here are questions 12 through 14. Question 12 introduces students to graphing, 
while questions 13 and 14 introduce the labor market. After finishing questions 1 through 4, you might prefer to have students complete the other items on this warm-up as unit introductions. I prefer to do them with the first unit to provide students with an introduction to the entire course. Here is the lesson on diminishing marginal utility. Utility means the satisfaction gained from consuming a good or service. It is measured in utils. As students copy the vocab terms from the slides titled Welcome to the Language of Economics, I tell them I will play music to improve their productivity. I play an annoying rated G song, but one I can tolerate listening to all day. I use Achy Breaky Heart by Billy Ray Cyrus. After playing the song once, I asked students to rate how satisfying listening to the song was on a scale from 1 to 10. I begin drawing this chart on the board and play the song again. Again we rate it. I continue to do so a third time, telling them, but you're not done with your notes yet. This chart shows some possible values from a student who likes the song. Hearing it once was not enough, the second time was better, but the third time in a row caused a big decline in the marginal utility. Hearing it a fourth time was awful, equivalent to eating so many desserts that you vomit. Another way to teach diminishing marginal utility and encourage volunteers in your class is to ask for a volunteer during class. Then ask them to stay after class. Find out what candy bar they prefer and if they mind eating several of them in one sitting. Buy the fun size, not the mini candy bars for this experiment. The next day, as other students are listening to the music, place one candy bar on the volunteer's desk and ask the student to consume the candy bar. Be precise with your vocabulary to model the language of economics for them. Start another chart of diminishing marginal utility for the candy bar volunteer. After they finish consuming the first bar, have them rate it, and then hand them another bar and again ask them to please consume the candy bar. Continue until they do not wish to consume. No giving bars to other students. In the future, students will volunteer. These are the basic vocabulary of economics. Thus, welcome to the language of economics. Tin Staffel. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Students will love to debate with you that there are things that are free. Remember, be sure to emphasize to them that somebody somewhere pays. Free to you is not the same as free. Because resources are used. The Table 10 activity in the St. Louis Fed lesson, It's Your Paycheck, is a great simulation of human capital that will help students to learn to work together and help you learn names in the process if you use the table tense. It's also a great opportunity to ask students what they will gain, that is, what their will, what is, it's also a great opportunity to ask students what they will gain, that is, what their return will be from the investment they are making in human capital. I conclude by calculating the opportunity cost of school. 180 days in a school year times 7 hours a day times the minimum wage. That's a lot for just one year of school. I ask students if they have gotten the maximum return on their investment. If not, they need to start now weighing their marginal benefit versus the marginal cost. Have fun teaching the fundamentals. You are setting the foundation for the future. Not just with your end of course scores, but with your students' futures.